بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I was about um, 22. I read the I read the life of Imam Al Ghazali. Let me hold you up the yeah, the golden book. Can you pass me the golden book? Probably. I read his life when I was just a little older than you all, and it was so beautiful. And I thought he was such a wonderful person. He started out in life. You know, he lived in Tus, Iran, and his father was very poor, and his father was a weaver, but his father valued education very much. It's very important to learn. So the father really struggled and sent the boys to the best teacher. But then the father died. You see the father is being buried right here. And, and the Imam al-Ghazali went on and studied with many great teachers, and he kept all of his notebooks, and he wrote everything down carefully. And then one day, thieves came, and they took away all of his notebooks, and he screamed, give them back to me. You know, it's everything I know. And the thieves said, you mean, if we take your notebooks away, everything will be gone? And that's when he realized, you can't just know about things, you have to be what you've learned. It has to be carried in your heart. And then he became very famous, and he became a teacher, and he rose higher and higher, and he taught in universities, and he was the most famous teacher in the world. And then one day, he, he noticed things happened. Leaders were killed. Things happened. Life isn't, is, is brief. And then one day, he began to worry. He thought, I'm out here. I'm teaching at this major university. I'm really important, right? And I'm doing it, kind of showing off. And I'm teaching all these people to do all these great things, and I'm not doing them myself. And so then he kept thinking, I've got to leave. I've got to leave. How can I stay here and be a hypocrite? But then he was afraid, how can I leave? Because I'm the head of a university. I have a wife and two children. What will I do? You know, I can't walk out. And then you know what God did? He, one day, Ghazali went in to teach, and he had no voice. His voice was completely gone, so he couldn't speak. So what he decided to do was to go on a long pilgrimage. So he left for 10 years. He came back and visited his wife and children occasionally, but you know what he did? He went all the way to Damascus, and he became a janitor in a mosque. Do you know what a janitor is? See, there he is cleaning the mosque. And a janitor is very humble, not somebody who's proud or brags, right? And so he went very humble, and then one day he realized, you know, Islam is not just about the outward look, saying beautiful things, doing beautiful things. It's about your heart. It's about the way the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was in his heart. So he wrote a book. He sat down, here he is in Jerusalem. He went to Mecca, as you see. So he wrote a book, right? 40 books called The Revival of the Islamic Sciences. And in these books, starting with what I'm gonna teach you today, he, he, from who we are when we're born to when we die, he gave you the inner secret meanings of, oh, where's my little clicker? Have I lost it? I had a clicker, or maybe I lost it. Fine. Um, well, I can just push the button. All right, is this the button? Okay, this is this. Okay, so what happened is, I read Al-Ghazali when I was a little older than you all, and I thought, this is the most amazing stuff. And then I grew up and I went to Cairo and I studied at a university there for 10 years, then moved to England and we went into publishing books. And then I started having grandchildren your age. And I started thinking, oh my goodness, grandchildren, they wanna know the real meaning. Why do we really have to pray? Why do we really have to do all this stuff? Well, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we put Imam al-Ghazali into books for children? It's really hard. So we would have some great scholar translate his book from Arabic into English, and then I would take the English, and I sat with it, and I wrote children's stories. 
and the stories come with workbooks and they come with um, uh, things for the teachers. But what I thought today we would do is I'm going to tell you stories today. I'm going to tell you some of the Ghazali stories. Then I'm going to show you some films of what children have made as a result of these programs, their own videos, and then we might do some games, some play acting. So what we're going to do is start with, I press this, just the, this thing here. Oh, that. All right. <clears throat> First, we're going to start with something important. This is very deep, but it's about the human heart. All right? If the Quran tells us that the heart, this is not the heart that's pumping blood. This is your real heart, the one I'm talking to. If the heart is the very essence of your being, right? And the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, when he went on the ascension, right? He saw the highest perfection with his heart, right? And if the revelation, if the Quran, where did the Quran come? To his head or his ears? No, it came on his heart. So your heart is the place, the crossover between time and eternity. We're going to start with the Book of Knowledge of Al-Ghazali. The first book he wrote, it had, it's the first book of the 40, and in this book, in this book, he explains what's coming in all the 40. So it's a very important book, and we have it here. So there are 40 stories. At first, he says this. Okay, I'm going to tell you. All right, children, I'm going to begin and tell you in your language what he told the scholars. All right, I'm going to ask tell you all something. Did you all know, did all of you know, there are two kinds of learning? Mm -hmm. One learning is like practical, right? Math, two and two is four, eat correctly, don't eat too many sweets. But then there's the real special knowledge, real special learning. And you know what that learning is? That learning is how to polish the heart. Did you know you had two hearts? You see, there's the one on the left, that's your physical heart that pumps blood, but the one on the right is a symbol for the spiritual heart. That's the one, if I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to your ear or your hair, am I? I'm talking to you, I'm talking to your heart, right? So that's, your real heart is who you are. All of you have golden hearts. Have you heard the term fitra? That's the real nature inside. You are pure, innate, pure goodness. That's who you really are, aren't you? You can feel it. That's who you are, all right? But every so often, you know, what? And then you know what the, the special knowledge is? How to polish the heart. Why would you have to polish your heart? What could happen to it? It could get dust on it. Let me think of some things. Maybe you don't share toys. Does that happen sometime? A little dust. Do, when mommy called you, or do, do you help mommy all the time? No, a little dust. But the question is, why would you have to polish that heart? Because there are two worlds. This world we're in, right, is pretty quick, isn't it? You've seen, have you ever had a pet that died or a grandmother that died? This world is quick and it's full of problems. We all get problems, but these are ways we can polish our heart. And then we go to the next world and the next world is forever and ever and it's, everything you've ever wanted, it's complete contentment and joy. So I'm going to tell you Ghazali's stories, all right? Now you know what your life is about, right? You're a pure heart, you're going to be sent difficulties to polish your heart with, and then there's the next world, so you don't have to worry about death, do you? No, there's the next world. All right, so Ghazali tells a story about an ant, all right? He says, we're like ants on a piece of paper. Do you see that? And we see writing. Today, we saw what happened in our day. And we think what happened in our day was because we can see a pen or a hand because that was what the plan was. But maybe something greater is going on than what we think we can see. Maybe Allah has other plans. So I'm gonna tell you a story about the baby ants, all right? Once upon a time, there were some baby ants and the mother and father said, we're gonna take you to the zoo tomorrow. They were so excited. And the next morning, the parents said, we're not going to the zoo because the relatives are coming. What do you suppose the baby aunt said? They went, oh, but you said we were going to the zoo. You promised. 
they were in moods, they were sort of in bad moods. We thought we were going to the zoo. So the relatives came, and the little baby ants all day long were kind of out of sorts, and then they heard on ant radio in the evening, they heard, oh, that very day, a lion got loose at the zoo, and all the poor ants were running and terrified and falling. So the parent ant said to the baby ants, you know what they said? Allah sent the relatives to protect us from going to the zoo. So sometimes when there's a disappointment or something you would want it to happen, it doesn't happen. Don't be upset, wait to see the reasons for this. One day, we li I live on a river in Kentucky, a big river called the Ohio. And one day we were gonna take the grandchildren out on a boat. To for the first time, my husband has a boat and we borrowed little life preservers. It was gonna be a big deal, you know, to go out on the river, and they were so excited. And then the day it happened, my grandson, Bilal, he got sick, and so we couldn't go. Oh, we'd be so excited about the boat. And then the next day, I went to visit him, and he was in bed, and I said to him, lucky you were sick, not lucky. Alhamdulillah, you were sick because that day we would have been on the river. There were huge storms in Cincinnati and logs and trees washed down and dead cows and buildings. If we had gone out on the river, it would have been very dangerous. So look at that. Allah sent him to be sick. So we, and then we went another time. So what the meaning of the ant story is, when something happens that you feel sad about or it didn't work out, you're disappointed, don't worry. This means trust Allah, right? Now another thing, Imam al-Ghazali tells you 10 things you can never do that dirty your heart. One of them, don't brag. Do you all like kids who brag? No, right. Uh, uh, yeah, don't be proud, you know. Don't be angry. It's not good to be angry. Just be quiet. But there's another thing you shouldn't do. You shouldn't talk about other kids or other people. That's called backbiting, isn't it? Did you all know about that? Oh, you do know about it. Oh, that's really important you know about it because backbiting or gossiping is so bad. You know what the Quran says about it? It's really terrible. I, I'm afraid to tell you it's so horrible. But the Quran says, if you talk badly about people behind their backs, right? It's the same as eating their dead flesh. Isn't that the most horrible image that's in our very Quran? So you shouldn't do it. And one day, yes. You didn't know about it. You know, this is true. And I'll tell you what happened to me. I've been writing these books, stories for children and I'd worked on the backbiting chapter for 22 rewrites, and I went out for dinner with some girlfriends, and they were talking badly about somebody's father, and I joined in and I said something bad, and going home in the car, I felt like sick at my stomach, and you know what happened when I got home? I threw up, exactly, exactly, and I never have backbited again. And one day, uh, just a minute, and one day, a, a mother called me and she said, I was at a ladies' party, and we were talking about other ladies, and my little daughter whispered, Mommy, are, are you backbiting? And I said, let me speak to your daughter, please. So she got on, and she said, Auntie, until we read the chapter on backbiting, I really had never heard of it. And I thought, you know, this is amazing. My own mother used to say to me, once a month, my dear, if you don't have something good to say about someone, don't say anything at all. She should have been saying it every day because it's that bad, it's that bad. And so I realized we should really be careful. And so many of our brothers and sisters, they'll say, that group's no good, they're no good, that person's a kafir, or that. We shouldn't say anything. Never do, you promise you're never gonna do it again? That's it, full promise here? All right, good. And this, see, in the workbook, we have a, a place where you can color and that's, you know, how terrible it is. They're backbiting about that poor little girl who's sitting on, the, on, the, on the, the bench. Now, this is something you need to know about, too. Did you know you have three selves? Okay. Now, well, I can walk, right? I'm not tied up to something. Okay. 
You have your lower self, it's called the nafs al-amara. And you know what the thoughts that self has? Hmm? That self has the kind of thoughts like you're doing it for yourself. You're thinking of yourself first, right? And then your scolding self, the nafs al-amara, it says, oh really, you should help your mom. Don't, don't, you know, don't, do, don't have that thought, have the correct thought. But then you can watch your thoughts. Sometimes I'm thinking I should get up and go and help that lady. And then that's a good thought. And then a thought over here says, oh, why bother? But I'm watching the self say why. I'm watching. So there's a self that can watch the whole thing. OK, let's pretend this. Say you're in bed, you know, and you're getting ready. You don't want to, and your mother comes and she says, get up for school. Has that ever happened? Yeah, right. And her, her lower self said, I'm going to pretend to be asleep. Have you ever done that? I used to do that, right? And then her scolding self, I should get up and please mother. And then her real self, my real self, I'm watching my lower self trying to win out. Don't, you've got to learn to watch that lower self. And I'm going to tell you a game we'll play later. This is a really good game. Like, you could stand here, and she could stand here. And then you can give a good thought, like, I'm going to help mommy. And then your friend can pretend to be the, the lower self. Why bother? Why don't you watch TV? You know, because there's a conversation. Watch the conversation, and then step over it and do the right thing. Just push on through. So a good game you can play is you can stand up and tell a good thought. And then, after you tell a good thought, you can stand over here and give a thought you're going to have, like, why bother? I'm not going to do it. Once I had a good thought, there was a friend of mine in England who was very old. And every day, I thought, call him, call him, call him. And every day, I thought, oh, it's a t different time zone. Oh, he'll talk too much. And you know what happened? He died, and I never reached him. The good thought I never got. We're, the, we're, the good thoughts are an angelic. So when you have a good thought, like, help mom, right? That's from the angels. And then the lower wasvisu whispers, don't do it. Be on guard. Will everybody watch out for that? Yes. Yes. You'll watch out? OK. So now, <clears throat> now something that you all, this is the last chapter in the Book of Knowledge. Now, this is something you should all know, all right? These are two trees. Ghazali ends this wonderful Book of Knowledge. And he said, we are all teachers. Do you know each one of you is a teacher? It's not just your teacher or your mother or me or anyone. We're all teachers. Because don't we copy each other? Yes, yeah, sometimes I see somebody and they do their hair this way. And I think, oh, I'll, I'll do that. We're all copying each other. So you have to ask yourself, do I want what I'm doing right this minute to be copied? Am I? So Ghazali says we're like two trees. A straight tree, be like a straight tree and your shadow is straight, right? And the people who follow in your footsteps will be straight. Yes? I got an idea for that. The bottom shelf for the low self, the high shelf for you should help the person. That's right. So it's like the, lock, the, the bottom shelf where your mom says, do your homework, you just don't do it. You just do whatever you're doing. But the high self says you should do it. Exactly. He, he has it exactly. So. What I want you all to be is, every, it, all day long, imagine you're a straight tree. If you're a crooked tree, like this, what kind of a shadow does, what kind of people, you, you know, it's really wrong. So you're all teachers, OK? Everybody knows it. We're leaving today. We're all teachers, all right? Now we have the Book of Belief, the second book of Ghazali, which I have here. And this is a little bit hard to do with you today, but this is now, let me ask you a question. If I asked any one of you to explain to me who and what and where is God, could you answer it? No. Okay, if, you, if, if my grandchildren asked me who and what and where is God, could I really answer it? No. But Imam al-Ghazali said it so simply and so easily that you know with this children's book, there's a university in Cairo called Al-Azhar, they have put this into Arabic, even though it's a children's book for their students, because it's easier, because it's simpler than the hard parent book. And there is an imam in England, and he uses it for, for adult teaching. 
but this book is really fun and it shows what we believe and also shows what happens to us after we die. And we're gonna later see a video, a little boy took Legos. You know what Legos are? Yes. Yeah, it's really quite funny. He, she saw it, no, we, we won't do it now. But he, he, he had a little Lego car driving along and it hit a tree, you know, and the car, and you're gonna see the film in a little while. And then suddenly he's like in his grave. And then the two beings come and ask him who was his Lord, what was his scripture, all the rest. So this book is that we've done is makes it really easy for you who and what and where is God, right? And what happens to us when we die and all the rest. And there's a, a workbook for this too. Now, Mysteries of Purification. How many of you all do wudu? Gosh, wow, all of you are big enough to pray? This is, that's great. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a story. Okay, children, once upon a time, everybody listen. Okay, children, there's somebody, oh, he's, sorry. All right, once upon a time, this is a story. There was a scholar, you see the scholar in his blue coat? And he was very proud because he was very smart and he knew all the knowledge. And an old man comes with the cane and he comes up to the scholar's door and he says, oh scholar, what is wudu? And the scholar thought, old man, you're a Muslim, you've lived in this village the whole, your whole life, how could you at your age not know what is wudu? And the old man kept saying, wudu, wudu, I wanna know what is wudu? And finally the scholar thought the easiest way to get rid of him would be to show it. So there was a sink, he said, come in, he did wudu, and then he said to the old man, now you do it. And the old man got it all wrong, he got it backwards. He did his feet first, you know, then his ears. So the scholar said, and this is what you're seeing in the illustration, Barra, out. Finally, throwing up his hands in despair, the scholar shouted impatiently, enough, get out of here, old man. The old man was shown to the door. But then the scholar started to worry. That's kind of weird. Wouldn't it be weird if you knew of an older gentleman in your community who didn't know how to make wudu? So the scholar said to his doorkeeper, follow the old man and see what's going on here. So the old man, the, the, the helper came back and said, oh scholar, I have some very bad news for you, you know? That old man that you threw out, he is like the great, beautiful teacher of our village. He's, we consider him very, very holy, very good. People go to him. So the scholar put on his robe and he walked into the town and he went to the old man and he went down on his knees and he looked up at the old man and he said, tell me, what is wudu? And the old man said, when you're washing your hands, we use our hands to do things, don't we? We do things. When you're washing your hands, you say, Ya Allah, I'm sorry for things I've been doing. Help me to do things that please you. And when you rinse out your mouth, I'm sorry for things I've been saying. I just yelled at my sister. I just said some bad things. I'm sorry. Make me, help me to say the right things that are pleasing. Listening, the right things to listen to. May my feet take me to the right places that please you. And so in the story, when the little children hear this, they say, wow, five times a day, we can think as we're doing our hands and feet and tops of our head and ears, we can think of things we should polish off our hearts. So five times a day, we get an opportunity to polish. All right? Oh, this is a, a very interesting story of Ghazali. Ghazali says, all right, I'm gonna ask all of you a question, all right? If a king were gonna come to your house tomorrow to visit you, a king, right? Would you polish the front door and make the house look great on the outside and inside you leave garbage and rubbish? That's like a law. If he comes to visit you, do you think if you're looking really good and clean and perfect, he's looking at your heart. So the heart is what you have to keep clean. And I'll show you a little film later that some children made about this. If, here, here's a drawing in the workbook for you. 
Ah. Oh, this is interesting. If a king, if you invited a king to visit your home, would you only polish the door and leave ugly rubbish inside? How is this like doing wudu only with outward movements and leaving your mind and your thinking about something else? What does Allah care about most? Your heart, right? Now prayer, here's is the book of prayer, all right? So, now, children, if you have some needs, some pressing needs, you need a new um, football or you know, a new doll or whatever you happen to need, a big need, would you go to the president of a company or a CEO and knock on the door, would he, re would he receive you? No. no, he doesn't care, right? If you have a need, guess who? Allah is always, he wants to hear from, about your needs. He's waiting all the time. When are you coming with your needs to me? You know, and when is a good chance to do that? When is, where's the place you ask him for what you need? Yes, prayer, right? So prayer is very important because this is the place you go to meet him. Now, I don't know whether you all have noticed when you pray, sometimes when you're praying, you start thinking about other things. It happens. Nearly this, as soon as you begin, you start to think about other things. You know what Ghazali recommends? He says that everybody starts with Allahu Akbar, right? The takbir. That's it. When you, when you do this, what you need to do is, no, I'm standing before the king. I'm standing before Allah, my creator, my Lord. And so while you're doing this, children, get yourself in a position where you're standing in your heart in front of him. And you know when in about two or three seconds, you're going to be thinking about something else because this happens to people. But maybe the next prayer, you can make five or six seconds. Do you see what I mean? And then during the prayer, you're saying Allahu Akbar when you change positions. Each time, try to remember, oh, let me not let my mind wander. It's not that you're the only people whose minds wander. All of our hearts' minds wander. But he, Imam al-Ghazali teaches you how to do things to um, make your prayer better so that you're, let me see what's next here. Oh, I have to finish one more thing about prayer. All right. This is really important, children. I know everybody is praying, and one little boy told me, I've got so I can do fajr in about 90 seconds. Another little boy said, I've got my wudu down to 30 seconds. But what Imam al-Ghazali asks is, do you want your prayer just to be doing positions and doing mouthing words? No, there's more to it. When you are bending, each of those postures means something. When you're speaking, when you're saying ayat from the Quran, each of those are different. You have to have different states of being. For example, if you're saying subhanallah, you should get yourself into a state thinking, I'm in awe, glory be to my Lord. And you could stand there and feel, oh, awe oh, for, for your Lord and creator. Then when you're saying, show me the straight path, edina sirata, you don't want to feel you want to feel low and needy. So what you can do slowly in your prayers is each time you do a different posture and a different phrase, you can try to learn to be in the right state of being. So it's not just outer movements, it's an inner state of being. You all are studying hadith and the sunnah of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. What you're trying to learn to do is to be the way he is on the inside. We're copying the outside, but don't we want to copy the inside to be the way he is? Isn't that what you're trying to do? Yes. Okay. The previous part you just mentioned is the one I struggle with. Which one? What, about what namas. About your mind? Yeah. The what? Prayer. About the prayer. You struggle with that. Yeah. But you know what? We all do. So it's good to be honest and say, let's do something about it. Okay, children, oops. I mean, I'm just giving you the tiniest taste of what's in these books, for these children's books. Okay, the mysteries of charity and fasting. Okay, why are some, okay, children, I'm gonna tell you a story. Wait, uh-oh, there's a, 
My, oh, I'm missing something. Uh-oh. I'm missing the one with the merry go -round. Okay, children, imagine this, all right? Everybody's here. You children are going out to the park today, and there's a merry-go-round, but it costs a little bit of money. So you have a little bit of money, and you pay. So the children in the story, they're on the merry-go-round, and they're noticing there's some other children looking sad, like they, don't, they can't go. They don't have the money for the merry-go-round. And they notice their clothes are really not so nice. And then the children leave the merry-go-round, and they're on their way to visit Hajj Abdullah, who answers their questions in the magic garden, where there are rabbits and spiders, and everybody's listening to hear about Imam al-Ghazali. And they get to the garden, and they, as they're running up to the garden, they pass, they pass this man who's begging. He's saying, Lila, have you ever seen someone in need saying, Lila? Maybe you haven't. Just as the group of children turned the corner, they came upon an old man sitting on the ground begging for help. He kept repeating, Lila, Lila. So the children run to their teacher, and they run and they say, Hajj Abdullah, why are some people rich and some people poor? Have you ever wondered that? That's a real question, isn't it? So Hajj Abdullah says, before, before I tell you, I want you to take this little money to the man out there if someone reaches out in need, you help him, don't you? You don't not help him. And then he said, when you say li la, li has two meanings. Li, for the sake of God, but li is it belongs to God already. Inna li lahi, surely we belong to God, right? So then the children come back and they sit down and he says, I'm going to explain something to you all. So I'm going to explain it to you all right now. You're going to hear what Imam al-Ghazali explains. Why are some people rich and some people poor? He explains that everything you are or have, some of you have different skills. Some of you are good in math. Some of you are good in sports. Some of you are specially kind. Older people, we have different skills. We, we have different friends. Everything we've got or have, do you think we gave it to ourselves? Did you give yourself your parents? No. Did you give yourself your beautiful backpack? No. You know, all of the things you have and everything you are, those are all on loan to you from God. They're an amana, a trust, and you've got to return them if they're on loan, okay? Because he owns everything and we are just there to return them. So here's a story. This is, oh, it's good to return. This is the way not to give, okay? Once upon a time, the king, who is like a law, he said to this man here on the right, there's a poor family, I want you to take them food because Allah had given this man lands. He raised fruits and vegetables. He had sheep and cows. And Allah had given all this land to him as a trust, as a, on loan. But the man had forgotten it was on loan. He thought it was his. Sometimes I give charity and I think I'm giving from what I earned. That's not right. It's not from what I earned. It's everything that I have, my skills, my ability to earn not, are not even mine. So this man has forgotten, and he takes the food. Okay, you stand here, I'll let you be the, the okay. You can, you can, okay, I'm gonna hold the plate up high and reach up. Re Do you feel great? No, no, I'm making you feel little, aren't I? Okay, I'm making him feel less because he's having to reach up. Okay, and you stay here, okay. So then, that's not the way to give, is it? Now, you come here again. This is, this is my helper here, all right? So now, uh, the king goes to another man and says, and I'll let that be you, okay? And he's, what's your name? Malhab. And he's, yeah, Malhab, you've been raised by a nice family. They've taught you about money and how to care for it. There's a poor widow in the town. She has no money to send her children to school. Take her the money, okay? So I'm the poor widow, okay? So kneel down a little bit. Okay, and hold, and, and hold me a plate of gold. Okay, low, low. So you're, he's holding the plate of gold, low. And then he looks up to me, and you know what he says? Oh, blessed lady, what a favor and honor for me if you would accept what I bring on behalf of the king, right? In order to make it possible for me to fulfill my loan or duty to God. Hmm? Oh, okay. So, that's it. So, now you know how to give. 
You give in such a way that you realize when you're giving to someone else, you are returning your loan to God because you don't own anything. Oh, they, okay. Then they run back to the, the thing. And this is one thing about fasting. Things, when you're fasting, you learn patience and other things. But also, you know what you're doing in fasting? Same thing as in wudu. You don't just fast from food and water. You fast from saying bad things. You fast from li listening to bad things. And you know something you can also do? You can, you can go into the mosque with a sleeping bag and spend and make, a, in the last 10 days, you could go and have your reading and spend the night and learn to have that wonderful last 10 days of Ramadan, maybe just one day in the mosque. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, oh. Okay, so we'll show you the videos the children have made. Children, we're gonna show you because people are gonna pray right now, just a few minutes of footage that I want you all to do this. I want you to borrow people's iPhones and make movies showing how you do something wrong and then you know how to correct it. So these are some of the movies kids have sent from all over the world to the children's website. In this video, you're going to learn about how the hand of pride and how it can really hurt someone's feelings. <laughs> Hi everyone! Look what I've got. It's the biggest trophy in the world. What have you got? Nothing. <laughs> Shame on you! Stop staring at me. Like, do you want my signature or something? <laughs> What my student did was not right. So this is what you call it being proud of yourself and it really hit that girl's feelings. The next year. Hi Zena. Hi. Did you wear anything this year? No. Oh, it's okay. Do you want to hold my trophy? Yes. We will celebrate together. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Manha. This is my sister Arwa. We have read the book of belief by Hazrat Imam Ghazali. It is part of our creed that all deed, good or bad, shall be put in the, the scale by Allah's love. Generosity. Patience. Sharing, trust in God, forgiveness. Mm, that was delicious. Now it's our time to go. Thank you for the bronze for office. Goodbye. Let's go ahead and drink something good. Yuck. Next day, you two girls have to go and say sorry. Yes, now we have thinked. It was very bad. We shouldn't have done that. There was such yummy food, but we liked it. That's why we were saying that. It's a bad thing to backbite. We're sorry, Mother. We'll just go and say sorry. Good. And I'll just sit here and wait for you. Yes, at last you've come. We're sorry. We just liked everything you gave us. So we just said that we're sorry. Okay. Thank you. My name is Anderson. And I am going to say that, I like to say that goats don't backbite and also not peacocks. So why should we backbite? It's a bad thing. We also shouldn't backbite. Hello.
Things you must learn. In chapter 11, it talks about things that can hurt your heart. One of the things is being greedy. Just another way to go away. Oh, there's so much. Please try to have so many plays. No, how about you try working like me? I'm a very wealthy businessman because I earned it. You're just a beggar on the street. You don't deserve I'll any play. money. <laughs> Then the greedy man then goes to work, and there's a big surprise waiting for him. Okay. You've done a terrible job with this project. I'm not happy with anything that you're doing. No, but sir, 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 please, please, just give me one more day, one more day. No, I'm done with you. You're fired. After being fired, the greedy man finally knew what he was doing wrong. He was not caring about others and being greedy. So then he had a change of heart and did something that changed his life forever. May I have some money again? Yes, I'm just so sorry about everything. I just got fired and as soon as I had to clean out to break the video. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Oh. Oh, uh, uh. Stop. Lewis, are you let me see your test scores. No. Let me see your test scores. Leave what does not concern you. Snay slam and mer eater. Tarkahu mala yane. Okay, here's Lena. She's going to read what she wrote. Say hi to the camera. Hi. Okay, let's see what she's gonna write. What she wrote. You have two hearts. One of them can get dirty, dirt on it, and the other pumps blood throughout the body. I learned this from El Ghazali. If you don't know who El Ghazali is, he is on the YouTube. And I drew a heart that accidentally got dirty, so you're polishing your heart. And this is the heart that pumps blood throughout your body. Thanks for watching, and the show's called Lena. My sister and I made a cardboard castle out of a box we had. My brother and I made a cardboard castle, and we both painted the windows gold.
and we both we painted both the outside gold and decorated it to, to make it pretty on the outside. Then we dumped garbage on the inside. This project was to remind us of Amem Gazelle's stories. Of Madame Gazelle's story. <laughs> if you invited a king to come to your home to visit your house, would you just polish the outside and shine the door? Just polish the door. What would the king think if he finds trash inside? Oh no! There's trash inside the golden castle! It would be like you only wash the outside of your body and leave the inside full of bad things! Ooh. Like not sharing and bad moods and not helping mama. You can make a box castle too! You can make a box castle Two. Two. To remind you that being clean on the inside matters most to God. That's what matters to the God most. Did you know you had three selves? A lower self, a blaming self, and a real self? What is something unkind your lower, not your real self, does? This false self only cares about itself. Maybe it talks badly about others. Don't identify or think you are that low false self. You can watch it and correct it. Now what does your blaming self say to this lower false self? Maybe it scolds. Oh, don't do that. It's beneath the dignity of your real true self. And your true self is watching and hopes. Oh, please, be your shining heart. Be your real true self. If your mother says, you are naughty, which self is she speaking to? not your real self. Did you know you have two hearts? Yes, there's the one inside you that beats and pumps blood around your body. It needs good food and exercise. But then there's your real shining heart, which is your real true self. It gets dirt on it when you do things that are beneath your dignity, like being selfish and not sharing or not helping your mother. You can polish your special invisible heart when it gets dirty and keep it the way it truly is full of light you can remind yourself of things you wish to polish away on your heart drawing Imam al-Ghazali says we may not be as strong as an elephant or a camel or as brave as a lion but we can polish our hearts and get closer to God and reflect His Noor, His light. The key activities that, that I like to think that make this place really special are the Sunday School, the Hub Club Sunday School, and the Quran Madrasa as well. 
So there was, when this place came into being, I think a lot of people agreed that there was something about this place which, which reflected peace and sukun. Um, the Sunday school came into being about three years ago. We started with very few kids, but I had a vision for the school and it was to make it something that was excellent and different from what was being delivered elsewhere so that the kids came and had a buzz about being here, that they loved to be here and they would go home wanting to come back the next week, that they would develop a love for their deen and that they would understand that making the deen part of their lives is as important as excelling in their dunya. Um, there's no doubt that the Ghazali Children's Project has actually been transformational for our school. It's really helped the children have a deep and spiritual understanding of the key aspects of Islam. Um, the really good thing that I think has come out of seeing the kids this year was to do some recap sessions on the work that they had already covered. And it was very easy to see how much they had learnt and all of the aspects of the Ghazali Children's Project involving self-development and spiritual understanding was quite deep set in many children already. So when we were asking them to, to do activities or make posters or reflect about certain topics such as the Baraka Blue video which they had watched during the lesson, they came out with answers straight away and uh, were able to make posters and illustrations about what they thought was most important from the video without much effort at all. And I think this is what we really want our children to take with them when they grow up. So we hope that the nuggets of information that they get from the school are things that they will take with them all their lives and then pass on to their children as time goes on. So what happened when I put more water in? Let's go this below, okay. How do you think that relates to learning? Okay. The so likeness of a person who's arrogant and proud of his actions is like somebody who's like a rock. And on top of the rock, it's just a thin layer, thin layer of soil or dust even. I'm having a bit of fun. I'm having lots of leisure. I'm playing games. Right, so I've, I've filled my jar up with all those things. Now, but I still need to do the other things that are important in my life. Where's my... Salah and my Hajj and my charity and my kindness and my fasting, where's it going to fit? The practical, visual, I think the children, we found out last year that the children really love the practical side of it. I think they love the practical activities that we, mm. that we did with them, yeah. especially the younger ones. The and even the older ones actually. The older ones love it too. They quite like Absolutely it, don't they? Absolutely love it. Uh, we, we go through the curriculum. We look at the activities, don't we? Because there's some very useful activities in yes, there. Yes, yes. And I they think. always connect back to the Quran, which is useful for us as well, isn't it? We like the practical activities the best. We do like the practical we? activities. Yeah. And sometimes, if we find that they don't suit our class, then we will modify them, we'll change them, or we'll do little because drawings, we're, we're, make we're, little drawings yes. to help each other understand what we're trying to say. And we write it with the view to upgrade it for the older children yes and to bring it lower to the level the of the younger children, children. yes and, and we've um, tried to have it had to have a format starting with a story a little bit of an activity a little bit of the workbook if necessary even if it's just referring to it for them to look at at home and then maybe ending with some liquor which is a really lovely way to just end with a bit more contemplation we look at the curriculum yes. and we look at yep. the chapters yeah and um um, we, read, we read through the chapters, see what we what we think are the key elements. Yes. Look yes. at the curriculum. And then the we back. look at the curriculum. Okay, that's a regular slot, isn't it? Yes. Well, we well, try with the story. If, if we can't read all of it, we'll pick out the main points. And then we can use this Ghazali book, which is the workbook. And um, it, it connects, doesn't it? We also try and bring in as many personal stories as possible as well, yes. don't we? Yes. We try and tell a story about ourselves. Yeah, because, because then the children yeah. think it's not something abstract, it's something that, yeah. you know, you faced, I was angry, I did this, yeah. or I did this, or I saw this. Yes, yes, or yes. Or my children did yes. this. It's, yes. It's nice to make it personal. Yes. But the things that um, they remember are the things that they've, they've drawn or seen. Yeah, and think. yeah it's true experience. Yes. When they get actual experience.
Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the, the kids of all ages benefit greatly from examples and stories, parables, and, and things that illustrate a key point, like the activity that you did with the candles um, and the sand activity, um, where, where the kids had to hold some sand in their hand and then the sand slipped through their fingers on the floor and it was trying to illustrate the point that if you say something that hurts someone else, it's very difficult to take it back. The younger kids engaged with that really well. The moment I read the first three or four lines of the idea where we have candles representing our hearts, after that, we, I just went with it, with my own creativity and, after, and once I started it with the kids, they were bringing their own thing into it. So, you know, wow. we had the candles and, 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 we, and the question was, what's the purpose of the candle? for it to be lit and if it's not lit it's not fulfilling its function wow. and these weren't in the book but these were where the directions you can go into and then there was one where and I started making like uh, like started speaking amongst the candles themselves oh wow you know you have this light on you why don't I have it um, so when I'm teaching uh, life after death for example an activity I'll do is um, I'll prep a student from beforehand um, and the student in the middle of the lesson will, well at the start actually, will come up to my desk asking can they take something and they'll collapse on the floor um, and then they'll get back up with a piece of paper saying I've come back but what if you don't? So the students actually, they, they feel this punch really because they're not expecting it and it really awakens them to respond from an emotional perspective which they otherwise might not do if they've just come from a PE lesson or a science lesson. So it's about awakening sort of the spirit within the individual. Another activity I do is talking about zakat. Uh, when they come in, uh, I say, I'm in a very good mood today. You can have a blank check and the head teacher has signed it already. So how much money do you want? So they make a list of everything that they're going to spend the money on. And then we've been a bit of numeracy because then I say, figure out 2.5% off this. <laughs> Um, and then they have to figure out their zagat and where they'd spend their money and you, you really tap into what they value in life as well, mm. what they'd be spending their money on. Mm. Say, elaborate, what's the connection between greed and the heart then, or spirit? The vices. Elaborate. There you go. I mean, the bad character comes from a bad heart and a bad spiritual state, that's why they're connected, that's why what you said is the same as what Ustad said, is that it's spirituality class, because you almost feel like in this class you're, in, you're more in touch with your spirit, and you also said your inner self, because you are more your spirit, which is your inner self, aren't you? More than your outward self. And you know how less your, you know the significance of your outward self, check this out, your outward self is so insignificant, it's always changing. Your face changes throughout life. Is your face ever the same? If you looked at yourself in 10 years time, you'd be like, whoa, that's what I look like. Right? And if you looked at yourself 10 years ago, you'd have said, that's what I look like. But your spirit, that's almost got like a different form. And she, she said that greed is linked to the heart and that essentially these classes are about the heart. And that's why his, and, and the heart is linked to, this, to the spiritual self. And that's why we connect our experience uh, uh, in, in manners and in good character, how it links to spirituality and that's why he called it the spirituality class, but it's, it's them. We know that when a person talks about their journey, it's like they're traveling again. I was mentioning a story to my, my friend yesterday and he said, it's like as if I'm traveling the story with you. you. Get a person to recall their story, they get their feels from that story. And that's what we just did with the kids. Tell me your story of the Ghazali class last year and let them go on and on and on. Let them have that moment and let them almost dialogue with themselves. As Rumi says, that when we speak, know that you only have an audience of one. And that can either be taken that God is your audience or you are your own audience. But the problem that I faced teaching them was mainly the fiqh side of it all because as Ishaq will tell you as well fiqh for, my, for myself as well growing up was quite boring mm -hmm. learning is too technical and that was the problem we were having when we were teaching them salah or zakah or even but about Ghazali salah. is spiritualized fiqh yeah, isn't it? that's it so that's why we, turn, we now started to use that approach because before it was just all technical and we could actually see kids falling asleep during the fiqh lessons <laughs> Um, so, um, and so many times you would say to me, 
what is going on. Like, look at the kids, they're falling asleep. They're falling asleep. Yeah, so recently we have started to, like, reassess the way we're teaching them the fiqh. It, it spiritualized it all and they made it very, it made it very fun for them and easy to understand it. Um, but the other problems that I think that with uh, teaching that age range is that the Ghazali uh, project is wonderful for the younger children uh, and we have had to adapt it a bit for the older children. The Ghazali project for me has been more of a character development course. When I describe it, it feels like it's a development of character um, and it's an opportunity for, for youngsters to really take some of those key principles of Imam al-Ghazali uh, from his teachings and for, for us to translate those essential points that uh, every human being should think about in a way that they can not just understand but also apply to the junior level. There's definitely uh, something that's, that works with the kids but when, you, when we get to teenagers, teenagers essentially are just young adults and it's like in mathematics, so when I'm teaching maths, I don't change the principle, principle of maths, I just change the scenario. It's just make it relative and so when we hear in the Ghazali book, I mean the superhero example that I gave was because the kids would, would relate to that. And that's why the journals are key here because let it be their own reflection, let it be their own lives. And that's why discussions and, and debates are cool because you get to hear more from them. I mean, one of the things I've benefited in this, uh, I think the kids have benefited, and that's one of the way that the 15-year-olds classes went towards where we just came in and I just asked them, how was your week? Because we'd already established what the class was about. So they almost answered that question from that perspective. And then just let them just let them speak, and then they'll they'll just be like, yeah, it was this, and you know, so on, so backbiting. And like, if they say once, that's job done. The rest is just enjoy the class. And this is one of the focuses we've had is that they enjoy. It. And I think for that teenage year, really, it's it's like from Ali radiallahu anhu's advice, fourteen onwards, just accompany them. So how you how are you going to take that Ghazali learning? and do it with kids at that age, it's almost let them come in and just be, let them just go on that journey with you and you just accompany them on that journey. Once I wasn't getting any sort of reaction from them at all. Yeah. And I said, you guys are tired of something. Like, you've been playing too much Fortnite. And they were like, Fortnite, sir, you play Fortnite? <laughs> you play Fortnite, sir? I said, no, I don't play it, but I know you guys do. That's why you're all, you're all tired. So that prompted them to suddenly just wake up and they were like different people after that. Once you can kind of relate to them at a certain level. So I think it's important as well to know what kind of environment they live in and then contextualizing your teaching into that environment. Yeah, I think with older t children and teenagers, one of the most important thing is not just speaking to them as if you are reading from a book, but rather become a personification of the book itself. And creating a human connection because as a teacher it's important that the biggest communication is not your voice but rather it's your body. And he went on this amazing journey of self-discovery to write these books and now we're reading his books and we're going on our own journey of self-discovery. So what lessons can we learn from Imam al -Ghazali? Number one, don't be proud and boastful. Because what does pride in being boastful do to our shining hearts? One of the, the things that the children have really enjoyed has been drawing hearts and making hearts out of card or out of different materials and remembering the idea of trying to shine our hearts. And they've written, they made little dots in the hearts to signify the dust that might be spoiling their shining hearts. We've tried to keep the focus in our Ghazali lessons on practical things as much as possible. So we've, we've loved the stories. We start every lesson with a story and try to finish every lesson with some vicar. But in between, we try to, to, to deliver the message through practical or craft activities. We're also trying to get them to, to practice their virtues every week. And to, we started the lesson, for example, by getting the children to introduce each other and saying one good thing about each other so that they understood that it's important to praise each other's virtues and be patient with each, other, with each other's faults. With the idea being that they're all teachers. Each child is a teacher, maybe to their siblings, their brothers and sisters, maybe to the children in their class. And when they do something good, other children learn from them.
okay, you find it hard to concentrate. Yeah, excellent. I find it easier for someone to not talk to me because then I get distracted. Excellent, you find it better when someone's not talking to you. Whilst I find it difficult because I'm there chatting to me. It's your day to day life. What things can distract you from doing, from praying on time, things like that? What can stop you? Fortnite. Okay, excellent playing Fortnite. You know, it's good because you can go home and you can discuss things with, with, with your children and that's the whole point uh, of the lessons as well is that as parents and children you're both developing and when you go home that knowledge is then reinforced you have discussions about it and you ask your children about it as well. And it's, it's really useful having the parents meetings now as well where we can discuss the books openly as a book club almost and go through each section and then um, all the ladies together, we can sit down and, and then we have the, the brother who's able to uh, instill more information in us and, um, and highlight certain topics which we would never have really understood and it's been very useful. We've been getting the books out at home and uh, sitting down. Uh, we have a little section at home which we have all our Islamic books and we like to just read through together. and. Um, uh, my, my daughter has been reading through a lot more than my son because he's only just started this, this past week. Um, but she's introduced it to him and his eyes are lighting up and he's really enjoying it. Um, I think the parent class really enhanced the understanding of the book because it's, it's a lovely book, you can read it. It's in today's 21st century language which applies to children. But I think that the nice thing about the parenting class is that it focused on each chapter at a time and each chapter had a particular theme which you could then take away and relate with the chapter in the book and then do activities with the kids. Um, especially the, um, the interactive comprehensive book that came with it. Um, it really, really made a huge difference to my children. And, and it just so happens my best friend, who's, who's visiting this week, I introduced the book to her yesterday, and she, she's read the first few chapters, and she loves it. And I loved it. The ideas I got from the activities book were amazing. I was just like, oh, I could do this with my class, I could do this with, like, everyone. It doesn't need to be just for Islam, it can be for everybody. It's such a lovely book, it's got such lovely values. And I feel in this 21st century, a lot of children have lost yeah. understanding of that of those values, and this brings a connection mm. in a like almost in a universal way of how to be a good person. The basic answers to the most fundamental questions of life is where I came from, what am I doing here, and where is going. And this is what Imam Ghazali came to teach is that it's not just about your physical dimension, you also have a soul. And that soul also needs nourishment. And the soul is not nourished by food, by water, by physical needs, but the soul is nourished to the remembrance of Allah. And that is what I'm trying to bring the youngsters, you know, because the, the young children, the elder children, they are like a blank canvas. So you can teach them uh, anything and they will take it like. Um, like a sponge, like a water takes in the sponge. I have been teaching Islamic studies for lots of years, many years, but this is um, this is what connects, like we're talking about, it connects um, us uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It gives us God consciousness and uh, Ghazali al Ghazali. And look, and we look within, so look at within, and you're looking without, and you're connecting those two actions. I liked the most when we were doing about the hearts and because I could learn more about shining my heart mm -hmm. and um, learn about my like what I could do and mm -hmm. how I could make myself better and help my mum and dad and I could Brilliant. make more deeds. That's really good. Each jewel is a kind deed that the Prophet did. So there's being kind to animals loving kids, prisoners of war and the black stone.
Joe. Gems, like le- some of our lessons were really amazing, and you realize there is it's not me or somebody there's else. There's something else involved. Running. So it's true. In the lunch break, we're all going around looking at what the kids have done and what the teachers have planned, yeah, and we're yeah. always taking pictures. And there's there's a real atmosphere of. It's a lively atmosphere and there's a buzz about it. And it's something that's very special. And I think it reflects the baraka that's in this project because it's, it's the sincerity with which the books are written. 100%. And it's also the sincerity with which the teachers deliver it and the way in which the children receive it. Every aspect of those, there's, there's so much baraka in it that the children just absorb it. And it's, it's like a, the whole thing is just a beautiful thing. And to see all these kids of different ages take a key message every week from the oh. age of four until the age of 16, it's just amazing. My poem is about how Allah blessed me with a beautiful heart and how he will always protect me from harm's way and how he will always help to keep my heart shining. Well, we've learned about, well, we have three periods. We have Quran, Imam al-Ghazali and Islamic studies. Mm-hmm. How is the Ghazali going? Is it all right? Yes, it's quite fun. It's fun? Yes. What? Like, tell us one fun thing. Well, we sometimes do actually. I think once we like, sort of put on a play of someone doing a nice action, I'm pretty sure. That's fun, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh, I see, cried Bilal. What they are teaching us saves us. That special real learning saves us from wasting our lives and makes it possible for us to go to the heavenly garden. This post is meant, is meant to be an example of... of uh, of the, the gardens of the of the gardens Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam done for us. Marshall, Marshall. That the real main goal of our learning is to is to get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels will become beautiful people on both the inside and outside. When you shoot an arrow you need a target. After dinner, the children's father, Hamza, set up a round target in the backyard. He was able to see what he, he is really, truly true and went then share that all with us. Aren't we blessed to have such a wonderful teacher who is showing us the way? Like in my uncle's Ali, he realised that he was a bit sh- showing off it mm. too much and he lost his voice mm. and that was like a miracle and and then it was he he became a mustard cleaner and told no one nothing about he was an imam mm. and he has a book of knowledge that we can learn from a man who came to see al ghazali just before he died and He related his experience with Imam al-Ghazali. He was completely inner-focused on the divine and had left the world behind him. When I entered into his presence, I said, this makes me cry, you are the lost thing I have been looking for all of my life. That's what I find with Ghazali, that state of being that he reached. Mm -hmm. You are the Imam who will guide me. Our meeting was an epiphany of inward knowledge. I witnessed something from him that is ineffable. He was a man whom, if you saw him, you saw a manifest spiritual state. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم
the Fons Vitae Al Ghazali Project for Children. Fons Vitae has taken on the monumental project of bringing out Ghazali's most celebrated work, the revival of the religious sciences, beloved over the centuries by the entire Muslim world for children. Regarded as the greatest compendium of Islamic spirituality and ethical behavior for everyday life, it lays down practical teachings and explains how the outer aspects of Islam can, through their inner spiritually transformative meanings, change every situation into one which strengthens the innate human nobility of character. The Prophet Muhammad said, I was only sent to perfect good character. It is hoped that in time, this will balance, direct, enrich and enliven generations of Muslim children. Al-Ghazali wrote, regarding the purification of both the outward and the inward, that one should know with certitude that the purification of the heart comes through ridding the soul of its vices and reforming it with virtue, and that a person who stops at outward purification alone is like someone who wants to invite a king to his home then busies himself with decorating its front door while leaving the inside full of rubbish and debris. Using the modern English translation of the complete work now underway by a team of scholars, each of the 40 books which make up the Ihya al will be presented in book and workbook form for Muslim children, their parents, and teachers. This aims to establish from the outset of a child's life reflex habits such as humility, patience, love, altruism, gentleness, forbearance, and respect for other faiths while providing children with real and effective tools to address such failings as selfishness, backbiting, arguing, laziness, envy, bragging, hypocrisy, greed, wasting time, and pride. These publications will satisfy a need for authentic, quality guidance for children at a time when their values are being formed. Children need to be raised as spiritual beings who are self-observant and self-correcting. We have seen how four and five-year-old children are drawn to spiritual truths. This project began a few years ago when Sheikh Hamza Yusuf called me in deep distress, worrying about how Islam was often being taught in a narrow, rote, and boring way which does not engage the imagination and the spirit of children, nor attract their enjoyment and love. A literalist or unbalanced understanding of Islam can make the young easy prey for those who might lure them toward radical views. A child needs to be handed back his dignity and his religion in a way that he or she can understand what it is really for and therefore truly desires to consciously keep his or her innate goodness of character intact. And so the project came to be. We would bring out an illustrated version of Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences for children, which would be based on the recent excellent 2011 critical edition of the Ihya by the Dar al Minhaj Press in Jeddah, in which 20 manuscripts from such libraries as Bosnia's Ghazi Huzrav Bey and the Chester Beatty were gathered among other vital features. Mohammed Hossein, who maintains the most complete website on Ghazali, and his wife Valerie Turner, one of the leading editors of Islamic texts, were taken by the majesty and scope of this project. Mohammed began to contract scholars everywhere who are now at work translating all 40 books of the Ihya al -Madin. We are aiming at a translation which is in clear and accessible English so that parents and teachers who will be working with these children will not find the content of the accompanying adult version too difficult to understand. Professor Kenneth Horner Camp accepted the overwhelming task of translating the Book of Knowledge, which is considered to contain the entire Ihya. It is now in its final stage of being polished Khaled Williams, who lives in Morocco, completed the second book, The Book of Belief, as well as Book Nine, The Remembrances and Supplications. Living in Marrakesh, Abdurrahman Fitzgerald and Fouad Arasmuk have completed translating books three to seven, the books on purity, 
prayer, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. Also completed our books 8 through 10, which now all need editing and preparation for the press. Of the remaining 30, there are many underway. Books we have already done, such as Marvels of the Heart, will later be compared and corrected against the Darul Minhaj Arabic edition. In the meantime, work on the illustrated children's books and workbooks has been underway. The first two books are nearly finished. Hamza Yusuf has written the introductions to both the children and adult series. The Book of Knowledge has 40 stories which are based on the wonderful instruction from Ghazali and on his metaphors which are ideal for teaching children about spiritual realities. An excerpt from the Book of Knowledge for Children, originally written by Al-Ghazali, now being edited and published by Fons Vitae. Chapter 18, The Ant and the Pen. Let me tell you a story about an ant. But what does this story mean? Why did Imam al-Ghazali write a story about an ant? Excellent question, Abdullah. So let's try to see the hidden secret message sent to us in this story. The children's book one, the book of knowledge, begins by asking, Did you know there are two kinds of learning? Besides the practical, everyday learning, there is the real, special learning the real learning. And what could that be? Oh, this teaches you how to polish your heart. Did you know that besides your heart that pumps blood around your body, there is the real spiritual heart? It gets dust on it when you do something that is not very thoughtful or good. But why would we need to polish this dust away? Ah, Al-Ghazali is going to explain why and show you exactly how. We have been having drafts of the first two books used in Islamic schools and by families in order to get their feedback. We have also been asking children to illustrate points they have enjoyed. Sometimes each child draws a large heart and places on it different colored dots which represent things he or she wishes to polish away. Children get it and both totally understand and recognize the truths being presented to them. In the Book of Belief, where such concepts as who and what and where is God and what happens to us when we die are discussed, we needed to find a way to present these ideas to children when the story form really won't work. A young man from India named Farooq, living in Abu Dhabi, mentioned how children love to have heroes and suggested they might like the idea of time travel. So we came up with the device of Ghazali appearing through a magic door, visiting the children and answering their questions. So it is our hope that our young children for generations to come will be able to understand that their faith is about the interior process of perfecting one's heart and eliminating base character traits which accumulate when the true nature of the heart is neglected. At a Fons Vitae fundraiser for this project a few years ago, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf gave a talk entitled, The Critical Importance of Al-Ghazali for Our Times. You can watch this on the Fons Vitae YouTube channel. This film went viral, and as a consequence, Muslims everywhere have come forth asking to participate in making this project a reality. He was interested in destroying the idols that our minds generate. He was interested in destroying the idols of the ego. And he actually considered the greatest idol to be the idol of the self. And in that way, he will continue to be relevant for, for all time because he, he set about really to articulate as best he could the way that that could be done. Maha Al Faisal from Saudi Arabia is translating our children's books into an appealing illustrated edition for Arabic speaking children. Another kind lady from Karachi is translating books one and two at this very moment and their workbooks into Urdu for Afghan refugee children in a settlement near Islamabad, as well as for seven schools for needy Pakistani children. She wrote that besides teaching the Quran and Hadith, I want the meaning and the spirit to be explained to them, 
unlike the usual madrasas there, so that it is a lasting source of nourishment for their beings. And a talented Egyptian artist, Farida, has even provided us with comic strips on the life of Al-Ghazali and other topics for the workbooks, which will be fun for the children to read on their own. Another lady from Cairo whom we have never met, Marwa, has sent in a complete set of project activities. What we are experiencing is the coming together of the global Muslim community, enthusiastically endorsing and contributing to this product. The Ghazali project will come out in family sets, each of which will contain the new adult translation for the parent or teacher, along with the children's materials. Included in the children's books will be an index which shows the corresponding page numbers in the adult book from which the ideas being presented were found. In this way, parents can be confident about the source of the ideas in the children's stories. We have really struggled with the illustrations. Most of the books for children that we see today have cartoon-like art, similar to what is used in all the electronic entertainment. We felt this was not appropriate or suitable for the nobility of Ghazali's message and teaching. Therefore, in book one, we have given an illustrator photographs of Muslim children throughout the world to present as beautiful traditional watercolors. The idea is that there is nothing higher or more beautiful than the human image, and also we want children to meet their global brothers and sisters throughout the Ummah. The workbooks are designed to reinforce the ideas the children are learning. They include games which can be played whereby the children actually put into use and practice the virtues they are studying. For Ghazali, it was very important that someone not simply know about and understand needed conduct, but to literally be the kind of example they would wish copied. Everyone, he explains, is a teacher. Book one will contain an instructional DVD which we made while teaching children from ages 6 to 13 at an Islamic school in Kentucky. This DVD shows parents and teachers how the material can be taught even to children who have not yet learned to read. The DVD is illustrated with drawings children from as far away as Dubai and Cairo have been making while using the draft books one and two. In addition to the Ghazali adult and children's versions of the Ihya Alumadeen, we have already published three books to support what is being learned. The first is The Life of Ghazali, illustrated by the award-winning artist Demi. This book has texts for both parents and children so they may read it together. A second book, also illustrated by Demi, is called Painting Heaven, Polishing the Mirror of the Heart, for both parents and children as well. The story is taken from Ghazali's Marvels of the Heart. It tells about a contest between artists, one of whom simply polishes a wall behind the curtain which separates the works being done. When the veil is pulled back, the reflection is more magnificent than the art it reflects because it symbolizes the polished heart, being able to reflect true reality, Allah al-Mafuz. In the back of this book, we have included the relative passages from Book 21 of the Ihya for the parents to read. Lastly, The Boy and the Owl is a story about the attributes of God based on the poem, The Creed of Salvation, by Muhammad ibn Jafar al-Qattani, who was born in Fez, where he lived and taught most of his life. We have a series of books on the way, which are stories for children, which will help them better understand such problems as showing off, greed, and being lost in too much entertainment. If there are any among you watching this video who would like to join us as translators, editors, or artists, please be in touch. Thank you. So when you say Ghazali's Ihya Ulum al-Din, Ghazali's revival of the religious sciences, you really mean a synthesis of the first five centuries of Islamic thought. Ghazali brings together the different sciences of theology, law, ethics, scripture, 
and uh, organizes them and elaborates upon his predecessors in a masterful and beautiful and accessible way. When you say Ghazali, it's really a one-stop shop uh, for classical Islamic thought. And making that accessible for our children is uh, uh, an, a massive gift uh, that we can impart upon them. We find that the Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam, is unmistakably and uncontroversially uh, Imam al-Ghazali, who had the uncommon uh, divine gift of being able to uh, encapsulate sometimes intricate metaphysical and ethical arguments in a form that is universally accessible. Scriptural quotations, sayings from the early Muslims, very well chosen uh, anthologized nuggets of, as it were, triggering catalytic wisdom. Ghazali as a basic theme and his great work, The Revival of the Religious Sciences, as the, uh, the focus for our project, one of the most important literary, cultural, religious projects that one could imagine in the 21st century. Knowledge wasn't an abstract set of data and information that was uh, imparted from parent to, to children, to from teacher to students. But it is the way by which that knowledge impacted their very behavior and their very being reconciling this split and this divide that we have between ta'lim and tarbiyah that reconnecting the knowledge with the practice reconnecting knowledge with character building reconnecting and that's what knowledge is a couple of years ago i did a little research project around the available islamic studies curriculum programs and i was really disappointed to see the the variety of issues that are challenging us today in the, in the curriculum department. And I am absolutely thrilled with the opportunity that avails our children today and our teachers and our parents with this Ghazali program. It is an opportunity for our children to start on the right path of belief, to start on the right path of principles, not to be raised in a in a vacuum of spirituality, but to be raised soaking in the spirituality behind all of the very, very important rituals and acts of belief that we want to teach our children. We want to teach them how to pray and we want them to love the prayer. Let's say realize what the meaning of education is. Educare in Latin means to draw out. That's what, what is already there. It doesn't mean to pile in info. So what we're doing with education is presenting children and ourselves with the truths that are recognized and it draws out the fitra, the, the noble self that's there. And I think what the Ghazali Project is trying to do is to, from children from the outset of their life, give them the self-esteem, the knowledge, the confidence of their pure, innocent, good nature. You know that. Our teaching has to really result in the outcome of a, of a person, of a believer, who is engaging in the world according to uh, sound teachings, and also someone who has the state of heart that will allow them to negotiate relationships with others and with Allah in a way that is, that is truthful, that is honest, that is sincere, and that always allows for continual growth. But I never see a program like this in my, in my career, I never see it. So when I saw this, I said exactly this is the kind of program that we have to have in the kindergartens and the, in the, you know, the nursery school so that they can really help the children to know exactly what they are doing. Growing up, I learned all the external things which were very fear-based and sort of tick boxes that I just had to um, implement as a Muslim but there was no real connection to what I was doing and I found that learning um, the religion through Imam Ghazali's work has given me that deeper meaning of the religion. We never really talk about polishing the heart, we never talk about the spirit of a person, we really focus on very external behavior as opposed to internalizing character. What the Ghazali Project talks about and deals with is educating the spirit, educating the heart, educating the entire individual. It's just amazing.
amazing listening to them talk about who God is and what God made and, you know, um, you know who we are and um, how we were made and, you know, who came before God and, you know, did anything come before God and what was the first thing God created? And so, um, and, you know, these are first graders, second graders, kindergartens, and so it's really fantastic. And, you know, it's, it's just, it's been an incredible journey so far. And I, as head of school, I've seen, I've seen the transformation in our own curriculum and in our own outcomes are you know our kids are excited to go to class this is the foundation of 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 our curriculum here at prairie academy i'm excited to see where this journey takes prairie academy i i can only wish that i had this uh, body of work that uh, she's doing now at the time when my children were young because i don't consider myself very academic and i didn't really feel like i had the tools to really teach them really about these things. One can only just absorb it in self and try and be a role model. But I think having that body of work is so, is really, really important. I think it's, it's really going to help the next generation. Well, there's nothing like the Ghazali's Children's Project. It's unique, it's uh, groundbreaking, and it's a treasure for our children. It's personally, it's changed my dynamic and my relationship with my children. It gives us a language to communicate. I liked the most when we were doing about the hearts and because I could learn more about shining my heart mm -hmm. and um, learn about my, like what I could do and mm -hmm. how I could make myself better and help my mum and dad and I could make more deeds. That's really good. The reason I like Imam Al Ghazali, it's really just fun. It's not like a boring, boring book it's really fun and it teaches you stuff which you might not have known and he teaches like stuff like how to do the wudu the Hajj Abdullah talks about interesting topics the children think of a lot of interesting stuff so that's pretty much why I'm addicted to the series but then I and then on my wall if you ever come to my house on my wall I drew a big heart with on a dry erase board I Stuck it on my wall. I drew a heart. Made it golden. There's a golden um, dry erase marker. So now I take a black dry erase marker, and I dot every time I do something bad, and I erase it when I do something good or I like apologize or something. We're now right now in the place called the Gambia, mm -hmm. and right like right before I went, I cleaned my heart up. First, I, like I know just because I wanted to clean it up, but like I actually literally cleaned my heart up. It's now completely golden. It's sitting on my room wall, completely golden. Oh, that's fantastic. It must feel good. It does.